Hi, Ann Pearson here. And before I begin today's episode, I'm excited to tell you about the Paralegal Bootcamp's new three-step roadmap to manage cases like a rock star paralegal. If you're fairly new to litigation, this quick start guide will help you figure out three things that you can be doing to help you better anticipate what the attorney needs before they have to ask for it. It'll help reduce some of those last minute scrambles, especially if you're working for an attorney who's a procrastinator or someone who doesn't always share all of the important case information with you. I put this three-step roadmap into a downloadable PDF for you, and it's completely free. You can get yours on our website at paralegal-bootcamp.com forward slash three steps. Hi there, you're listening to the Paralegals on Fire podcast show where you'll be getting tips and actionable strategies that you can use right now to fast track your paralegal career. I'm your host, Ann Pearson, former paralegal and paralegal manager who left big law in the concrete jungle to start my own company, the Paralegal Bootcamp, where we give online courses that help paralegals make more money, increase their job security, and cut out the learning curve. All right, let's jump right into today's episode. I'm back this week with another Q&A. Our last one on billable hours was a big hit. I'm going to do one of these each month and keep them focused on a particular topic. So this month's topic is litigation. The first question comes from a paralegal who says her husband's company is transferring him to another state and she's worried it might be an issue finding a job in litigation because of the rules being different in Florida than they are in California. Good question. Also, she added that she's done some preliminary searching and saw some ads for litigation paralegals, and the ads all said they wanted someone with Florida experience. All right, well, let's start with the current state of unemployment and hiring challenges that employers are having right now. If you've got seven years of experience working in litigation in California and you're moving to Florida, a law firm would be stupid not to want to hire you just because those seven years of experience came from California. Look, litigation is litigation. It's just different rules of civil procedure in Florida than in California. Besides, most of the time, you have to go look up the specific court rule for whatever it is you're doing. Even if you've been working in Florida for the last seven years, when it's time to go to trial, you're going to go check your local court rules and the state court rules, along with the judge's specific rules. So as long as you know how to find the relevant court rules, you're going to be fine. Back in 1996, I moved from Florida to Atlanta, Georgia. I had no problem whatsoever transitioning and figuring everything out. And it wasn't like I was anyone special either. I'd only been a litigation paralegal for a few years at that time. So I don't think that you're going to have any problem finding a litigation paralegal job in Florida. And as a side note, our next month Q&A is going to be all about job searching. So it's going to be a job search Q&A. So for the listener who sent in that question, definitely tune in next month for our Q&A. All right, on to our next question. I just started at a new law firm last month and a little overwhelmed trying to get up to speed on my cases. I am the lead paralegal on two very big cases, and they haven't had a paralegal for at least the last four months before I started. How can I get up to speed fast? I think something that could help you is what I had recommended in our three-step roadmap for new litigation paralegals. Even if you're not new to the litigation practice area, this would help because it can also be a method that you use to get up to speed fast on new cases. First, you're going to want to start by reviewing all of the motions, briefs, discovery responses, pleadings. Instead of doing the typical thing when someone's getting up to speed on a case, which is just reading all of those things and taking notes and then trying to rely on your memory. Instead of doing that, I'm going to suggest that you extract specific information from those documents that you're reviewing, the names and roles of every person who's identified in them. And you're going to put those into a player's list. Second, you're also going to extract any dates that you come across during that review and put those into a chronology. Third, 
as you're doing that review, have a master to-do list for that case where you can make notes about the things that you come across. For example, when you're reading the discovery responses and the other side objects or says they're going to respond at a future date with more complete information, make a note of following up to see if that's ever happened. So you've got three documents now, a player's list, a chronology, and a master to-do list for those big cases. Yes, that process may seem a little time-consuming, but think of it like this. If all you do is skim the complaint and the answer, and you have a few talks with the attorney in charge, you're not going to know everything that you need to know to proactively manage those cases and to get on top of them. You'll just have an overview. You need to get deep into the weeds. But there's two other reasons that you do this, in addition to being able to manage the information. First, you'll have all of that information in one place, preferably an Excel spreadsheet. And then you'll be able to do things like filter the data, sort the data, put the chronology into a timeline, all kinds of things. Second, and this would only apply if you're billing for your time, but it's a big one if you are. We all know that clients don't want to pay for a new paralegal to get up to speed on their cases just because the previous paralegal left the firm. And yet that's exactly what you have to do in order to properly manage the cases. However, if you're preparing something that adds value to the case, especially a physical thing like a player's list and a chronology, something you could attach to an email to the client if they wanted to see it, that time spent wasn't just getting up to speed on the case, it was preparing something that puts all of that information in one place and can later be used for all kinds of things, including getting ready for depositions and getting ready for trial. If you want a more detailed written version of how you can do those things, go to the website, the Paralegal Bootcamp website, paralegal-bootcamp.com forward slash three steps. It also gives you some examples, like for the players list and the chronology and the master to-do list. So that'll give you something concrete, an actionable strategy to take away. Our next question. I'm graduating soon from a local paralegal certificate program, and I want to be a litigation paralegal. What litigation software or applications should I try to learn to help me work in litigation? Well, first, congratulations on your upcoming graduation. So I think that there are two categories to this answer. First, what software or applications can you learn now that you have access to and can continually use to keep those skills sharp while you're trying to find a paralegal position. And the second category is, what will you be expected to know, but you maybe don't have access to now? And even if you did have access to that software, you know, it might be different than the one that you learned. And more importantly, even if you found free trial or free training on these software products, if you don't put it to use in the real world, then you probably won't retain much of what you learn. So let's start with the first category, the ones that you can learn now that you have access to. And that's the three big ones, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and Adobe. Look, I know it's not sexy and exciting, right? Word, Excel, and Adobe. But those three software tools are the ones that you must have more than just a basic knowledge of. And you're going to use them regardless of the type of employer that you end up working for, regardless of what practice area you go into in litigation and what other tools are available. Regardless of all that, those three software tools are ones that you will use for your entire paralegal career, no matter where you go. Here's the thing. You can get access to all three of those right now, take training online, keep using them, and keep advancing your skills. The other category is all of the other litigation technology tools that you will use as a litigation paralegal. But even if you got some kind of trial access or student access to it now, if you're just playing around in the software and doing some demos and not really putting what you're learning into real life practice, you're probably not going to remember most of what you learn because you can't really apply it to anything. So I'll list them, but I think your time is better spent getting to an advanced level 
of the Microsoft applications and Adobe. So there's Westlaw and Lexis, which you probably got student access to while you were in school. There's also e-filing, and that's the applications that allow for you to electronically file your pleadings, motions, briefs, and other court filings. Back in the old days, um, haha, no, I'm not going to say we used to have to walk to the courthouse in bare feet in the snow, but back in the old days, there was no such thing as electronic filing. When something needed to be filed with the clerk of court, we had to get in our car and drive to the clerk's office or hire a courier to do it for us. Hopefully, they covered that in your technology class, the e-filing in your paralegal certificate program. Then there is the document management system that organizes the electronic version of everything in the case, like the Microsoft Word documents that you're drafting, memos, um, those types of things. This one is so very specific to the employer that it wouldn't be helpful for you to learn any of them. There's also the e-discovery software, you know, that's used to process, review, and produce discovery in the case. That software is also very specific to what the employer uses. Now, I could tell you the names of them, like Relativity is one of the e-discovery tools, and Relativity does have free online training. But first, you don't know if the firm that you're going to go to work for as a litigation paralegal has relativity or if they have some other application. You don't know if they have a specific trial presentation software either. So it really wouldn't be very, it it just wouldn't be a good use of your time to go out and try to learn all of these different case-specific or firm-specific software products when you might not even use that you might have a completely different application. I'm going to do a separate Q&A just on the topic of e-discovery. So be sure to follow the podcast so you can learn more about that topic. I think that deserves its entire, an entire separate Q&A based on e-discovery. Then there are the deposition software applications, as well as trial technology. Again, all of them very specific to the employer type and the practice area. For example, let's say you find yourself at a solo practitioner or a very small firm that doesn't go to trial that often. They might use an app and an iPad at trial compared to another firm that might have a more expensive system designed for their team's specific needs. That's why it wouldn't do you any good to go out and learn those specific litigation software tools, only to find out that the firm doesn't even use it. My advice Stick to category one and learn everything you possibly can at a very high level in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and Adobe. Our last question comes from a litigation paralegal whose case is going to trial, and she has her first pretrial conference coming up. She's never been to one and worried that she's forgetting something. All right. Well, I can tell you that the best thing that I ever did early on in my career was I asked to attend a pretrial conference. You know, for the first few years, I had quite a few cases that went to trial and I went to trial with them, but I hadn't attended the pretrial conference before the trial. I just got my task list from the attorney going to the pretrial conference. This is what they want. This is what they need. Check. Done. And inevitably, there was something brought up at the pretrial that the attorney didn't have access to. It's so much easier for you and for the attorney if you actually go in and go to the pretrial conference and understand how that whole process works. Because attorneys don't think like paralegals. They practice law. They want to win arguments in court. They don't think, well, this might be better organized if it was alphabetically by case law. Or next time it would be easier to read from it if it was this way. But you have that ability and that skill. So my first piece of advice is to attend this pretrial conference. Even if you can't bill your time for it, it's worth it. Just ask if you can attend that one or another pretrial conference. The worst thing they can do is say no. Or if they say, well, I don't need anybody else there. Ask if you can go to get the experience so that you'll be able to better support them. 
Okay. And so let's say that you can go, or maybe even if you can't go now, obviously the basics are the pending motions, the exhibit lists for all the parties, the witness lists for all the parties. They're going to talk about the witness testimony. They're going to want those deposition designations and an updated, what I call working exhibit list, which is different than the formal exhibit list that gets exchanged with the other side. The working exhibit list is going to have a lot more detailed information about each exhibit. That's for you, for your eyes only, or the attorney's eyes only. And a good rule of thumb that I go by, you can never really send too many files to the pretrial conference because they have to be prepared for anything, essentially. So imagine that maybe there are only 20 exhibits at issue that the other side has objected to and are going to be addressed at the pretrial conference. And you have a thousand exhibits on your exhibit list, but only 20 are actually you know, at issue. Well, they may say they only need to bring those 20 exhibits that are at issue. I can guarantee you inevitably one of those other 900 exhibits will get called into question and they only have those 20 exhibits with them. Now, the other thing is, especially nowadays, everything's available electronically and the attorneys are probably going to be pulling up those 20 exhibits on a computer screen, right? For the judge to see. And so You know, it doesn't make any sense to only give the attorney access to the exhibits at issue. Now you can keep them in a separate file folder if it's electronically or even in paper. Keep those 20 in separate a separate file folder. So they only need, you know, one copy, but they need to have all of those exhibits there. All right, next you're going to want to figure out how to organize the motions. One way to organize them that I found helpful after I attended the pretrial conference was in the actual working of it, of the conference. Because what typically happens is they're going to get up and argue one motion at a time. And so instead of having this massive notebook with all of the pretrial motions and all of the responses and replies in one place, and then the case law that's cited in each of those motions behind the motion in that same notebook, instead of doing that, what ends up happening is They argue one motion at a time. So why not have, let's say you have five pending motions, have five separate notebooks, and then the case law is in its own separate notebook instead of organizing the case law with the motion. Organize the case law alphabetically and put it in one notebook because we know that that case law is going to be cited in various motions, the same case, right? You could have one case that's cited in four different motions. And when the other side gets up and cites to that case, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know which case that motion or that case law is behind. So you have them all in one place instead. And they're organized alphabetically by the case name. So put all the case law for all of the motions organized in alphabetical order by their case name, and then have the five smaller notebooks, assuming you have these five pending motions, hypothetically, these five smaller notebooks so that when they get up, they argue their motion, they have the motion, the responses, the replies in that one notebook. All of the case law, the big thick case law notebook is sitting at the council's table that they can easily grab and flip to find a case. And then just make sure that those notebooks have big labels on them so that the attorney, if you're not there, can easily grab that next notebook for the next motion that's being argued. So with these, I put big stickers on the outside. It's got the name of the motion. It's easy for them to grab it. Got to make it easy. Also, I would say when you're preparing for the pretrial conference, you're going to want to have a method to track which objections are granted and which ones are overruled when it comes to witnesses and exhibits. You can do that on the proposed exhibit list and the witness list, which I'd highly recommend. You're going to want to know which ones you won't be able to use at trial and which ones the other side won't be able to use. Now, When we used to bring the exhibits in paper, I would also put a note or use a slip sheet to put inside that trial exhibit folder, indicating what the judge's ruling was on the exhibit. So it would also be easy if someone grabbed that trial exhibit folder, they would know that trial exhibit isn't supposed to be used. 
All right. Well, thank you for sending in those great questions. And that's it for this litigation Q&A. Like I said earlier, we've got another one coming up next month, which is going to be our job search Q&A. So if you have any questions related to resumes, interviews, the job market, any of that, go ahead and submit them by email or in the comments to this episode, if that's easier. I'll need them before December 21st if you want them to be answered on next month's podcast. And if you're new to litigation, don't forget to download that PDF for your three steps to being proactive on your litigation cases. Go to paralegal-bootcamp.com forward slash three steps. All right. Well, have a great week and I'll see you back here next Tuesday. All right. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, hit the subscribe button in whatever platform you're listening. And please take a quick minute and leave a review of the podcast and share this episode with just one colleague or friend who you think would benefit from what we discussed today. Share the knowledge and the entire paralegal profession elevates. See you next week. Bye for now.